at the new school. We believe creativity isn't a concept. It's a calling. It's what drives you out into the world to make the things that make a difference. At our schools, we teach creative problem solving by dissolving walls between academic disciplines so you can rigorously rethink everything. Together, we draw inspiration from human insight. We purposefully collaborate, try things over and over, and become invaluable to a world that doesn't exist yet. It's why our university is filled with journalists designing new media, playwrights creating tools for social good, designers collaborating with ethnographers and anthropologists, economists examining human interactions, musicians and media artists composing with light and space. Creativity in the right hands changes everything. Because it's not what you know, it's what you create with what you know. Make the future catch up to you. We do. The new school in New York City. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Erin Stein. I'm the director of undergraduate admission at Parsons School of Design at the New School. Thank you so much for joining us on this weekend. Today, we're going to share with you a little bit about the history of who we are as a university, our individual programs and areas of study, and get to hear from a few key faculty members and administrators about some of what we do here. After that, we'll release you into some more specific areas for additional tours, meeting with program directors and current students, as well as the opportunity to learn more about student financial services um, and some of our summer programs. But to get started, um, talking about the new school itself. The new school was founded nearly a century ago by academic visionaries who were frustrated with the timidity of the intellectual pursuits in Europe at that time. They came here to start a new school of thinking. And actually, th this next year, um, it'll be approximately our 100 year anniversary from our founding in 1919. Today, we're known often as our individual programs as much as we are the new school. So we have five um, different schools here in New York City, three of which offer undergraduate programs. Um, and we'll focus mostly on Parsons School of Design today, but I'd also love to share more about our liberal arts and performing arts programs. And we also have our campus in Paris, as well as two schools that house our graduate programs. So one thing that we're thrilled to do here is invite um, artists, designers, performers, creative thinkers from all over the world to our campus as a part of a university that's made up of about 10,000 students um, from 50 US states and 116 different countries. And we're proud to often be the most international institution in the US, with over one third of our students coming to us from overseas. Now, this is the Parsons portion of our open house day. So to talk a little bit more about Parsons itself, Parsons was founded in 1896 as the Chase School, and actually a group that seceded from the Art Students League of New York. And they wanted to um, have a, a more individualistic um, approach to their education and learning. Under the eventual leadership of Frank Parsons, we're now the institution we are known as today, connecting art and design with industry. Um, and so with that, um, I would love to introduce you to our executive dean of Parsons, Joel Towers, to share a little bit more about the university itself. Good morning, everybody. Is that on? Ah, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Phil. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here. And um, as Aaron said uh, a moment ago, and if you did the math on that, Parsons was founded in 1896. The new school is about to be 100. In a couple of years, Parsons will be 125. So we're having lots of celebrations of the longevity and the integrity and the vitality of the educational programs that we offer here. I'm going to talk to you about Parsons, obviously, um, and I want to talk to you in particular about what differentiates this school uh, from all other schools of art and design in the United States. Uh, I've been here now about 15, 16 years. I joined the faculty here as the director of uh, sustainable design back when that term was not as uh, popular as it is in the world today uh, because Parsons recognized early 
that we had to be thinking forward about our curriculum. We had to be looking at the issues that would be transforming the world around us and be thinking about the ways in which art and design and business and innovation and strategy and foresight play a role in the education that we can offer here. Parsons is the largest of the five schools uh, here on campus in New York uh, and uh, has about 5,000 students, a little more than 5,000 students across undergraduate and graduate programs. Uh, and, um, and it's that position within the new school that differentiates us. It's the reality that uh, most art and design schools that you will be looking at um, as potential uh, places to apply are what we call standalone art and design schools. Uh, they're fantastic schools. They're, um, we see them as our collaborators, sometimes competitors, but they don't typically sit within a university environment uh, as comprehensive as the new schools, a place where the humanities and the liberal arts and policy and the social sciences and performance all come together to provide a very rich and dynamic landscape for the study of art and design. And it's that interplay between art, design, and business that we teach at Parsons, and the humanities and the public uh, policy and the, and the social sciences and performance that gives it the rich, dynamic curricular opportunities uh, that we are able to take advantage of here. And so the real question uh, at any, anyone considering studying art and design um, or coming into a creative business environment is why design? What's the critical question today that brings you to this point of study? Now, many of you have thought for most of your um, lives that you wanted to be a fashion designer or an industrial designer or you wanted to be an architect or a product designer or any of the things that we study. And so the question to you is not so much why design but why here and why Parsons. But I want to start with that very important question of why design. If you think about the world around you, if you think about how you got here today, if you think about um, where you live, if you think about the places that you visit, in a very real sense, the world that we live in is a designed world. There isn't a part of this planet at this point that hasn't been touched by human activity, intentional human activity, which is to say designed human activity. That does not mean that that design has been good or thoughtful or reflective, but it means that humans are transforming the planet on which we live in a very, very real way through their intentional actions which is to say, through design. And so there is, in some, in some ways, no more important activity than the creative, thoughtful transformation of the world around us through design in all of its different capacities, through all of the supply chains, through all of the use cycles, uh, through all of the problems that exist to be solved through design. Design is a critical component of human activity, and never more so than in this moment in which we live. So the reason to enter design school, to enter art school, to think about being uh, in a program like our BBA in strategic design and management for business is to bring that creativity, that innovation to your lives as transformative agents. Why should we do that here? Well, I mentioned the new school. Uh, and I think that really does differentiate the kind of design experience you can have because what I just described to you is a very broad perspective on what it means to be a designer. It requires you to understand people. It requires you to understand history, to understand transformations and economies, and to function in that space. And there is nothing like the new school to give you that broad-based education to be able to leverage design, to use it thoughtfully, to be reflective in your practice. So, that's one of the key reasons why here. The other here is New York City is this extraordinary center of innovation and creativity. The, the heterogeneity of this community here in New York City, the eight and a half million people who make up this city, Aaron mentioned our international um, uh, makeup here at the university at Parsons, we're over 40% international, which makes us even more international than New York itself. And it's from that diversity, from all of those different countries, from all of those different histories and perspectives, that innovation arises. Because you're not sitting around in a classroom with people who come from exactly the same background as you, uh, looking at the same problems in the same way that we've always looked at them. You're hearing innovation and creativity come from different perspectives, from different people's 
ideas about how you might solve a problem because they themselves come from different backgrounds with different views on what matters in the world. And finally, why Parsons? Well, as I mentioned, we have this fantastic history. Uh, we have this very robust commitment to um, art and design education here in New York City. But mostly what we have, and there are sort of three legs to this, and I will talk about them for the remainder of my brief presentation to you, which has to do with our faculty, it has to do with our facilities, uh, and it has to do with our curriculum. So I'm going to start with the curriculum. Uh, about 12 years ago uh, at Parsons, we, we said to ourselves, we meaning the faculty, but also our alumni uh, and many of our students, began a project to rethink art and design education and business education for the 21st century. Now, we were already in the 21st century, so we were a few years late. But it was about 2003, 2004, 2005, and we said, the education we are offering and the structure of that curriculum, the entire arc of that experience is something that has been very successful, but it also hails from a period of time in which the relationship of art and design and innovation to industry, a, cre a critical part of our, of our curriculum, was changing. We were living more increasingly in post-industrial environments. We were having to deal with the environment itself. We were have to think about um, renewed urbanization and the growth of cities. Uh, and we needed to rethink the relationship of design study to a whole range of new technologies and new practices, and ultimately to a cross-disciplinary collaborative environment in which art and design practice and business happens. And to do so meant moving away from a traditional kind of Bauhaus model of education and rethinking the curriculum. And that was a project that we took our tremendous amount of care and time with, working with hundreds of faculty, and as I said, alumni and partnering with industry and students. And we were able to rethink this curriculum um, to be truly innovative. And I think the reason that Parsons is ranked as the top art and design school in the United States consistently is precisely because of this curriculum and the success that it provides for our students upon graduation, because they are prepared to collaborate. They're prepared to tackle problems in the world in a really cross-disciplinary way. And so it starts with this remarkable first year. Um, it is not a first year like other foundation years in art and design school. Uh, it really looks to um, open up the landscape of thinking and making at the same time through our integrative sem seminar and studio structures. We introduce sustainability in the first year. We enable a kind of horizontal, hybrid thinking about art and design practice, but we also allow you to begin the process of going deep into your own disciplines, either through the selection of courses that are inflected, the core courses that are inflected toward areas that are related to the practice that you want to study, but also through the opportunity um, to take uh, electives uh, in those areas. After that first year, you're entering into your majors. And uh, there are also an opportunity to come in through an undeclared path. And Aaron will talk a little bit about more of this uh, in a few minutes. But as you enter into those majors, we have continued to build out the possibility of working laterally, of working horizontally. So it's possible, for example, not just to be studying deep into the discipline, but to be taking a minor. So what does that mean? And those minors, by the way, are not just at Parsons. They really take advantage of the whole university. So you could be a fashion design student who decides that they want to have a minor in um, Mandarin. Or you could be uh, a, an industrial design student uh, or a product design student who wants to take a minor in anthropology. Or you could be a Bachelor of Business Administration uh, strategic design and management student who wants to take a minor uh, in photography. There's all sorts of options available to you. And the point of this is to say that, again, this depth and breadth is the characterization of a Parsons education. So the curriculum is quite extraordinary. Um, the other thing, however, is that we really use the city. Uh, and we use the city not just as a place uh, of study, but a place of engagement. So what you see here uh, at the top is the trusteeship council chamber at the United Nations. Uh, every year, um, we bring students there for a course uh, called Sustainable Systems at the, with a partnership with the Danish government. 
uh, that enables us to not just introduce students to these extraordinary spaces, but really to hear from leading experts around the world on the kinds of issues uh, that they will address. We use the city as a co-curricular space. It's part of where your learning happens, uh, and that's really uh, critical. Um, the other thing uh, that, as I mentioned earlier, there's the curriculum as a, as a kind of core and I think very unique part of the experience of being here, but there's also the facilities. Now, some of you have already been uh, over to see the Making Center. You will go there uh, later, I think, on other tours. You'll get a chance to move around the whole campus and see various different types of um, classrooms and so forth. But the facilities here are really key to the kind of interdisciplinarity that I was just describing. Uh, the building that you are in, this university center, which was completed about five years ago, enabled us, for example, to bring the fashion program downtown um, and allow us to bring fashion and the rest of Parsons in an integrated relationship um, that has opened up those minors and has really broadened that curriculum to enable it to not just be about the making of um, garments or a collection, but more broadly about systems and materials in ways that are really transformative to the industry itself. You couldn't do that if we weren't in this kind of crossover space. This building also brings the entire university together through lecture halls like this, performances um, that happen on this stage, which actually can expand uh, and take up this entire front portion. And we do dance performances and music performances here um, from the College of Performing Arts. There are plenty of lectures. This building and its cafeteria, which I won't go into because it's a much longer story, but a fantastic story about our commitment to local food, to uh, sustainability and organic food production and fair labor practices in farming. All of these things come together through uh, this space. Um, in addition, uh, we have 4,000 square feet of gallery space uh, here at the university between the Aronson Gallery and the Kellen Gallery. The Kellen Gallery will be open in a little while, and you can walk through and see the Earth Manual project that is up now, the culmination of three years of work through our School of Constructed Environments, uh, focusing on the issues of um, disaster preparedness, uh, an issue that is uh, clearly um, uh, requires design and design thinking um, in a world, as I said earlier, transformed by human action. Uh, in addition to that are the Making Center, uh, which I mentioned to you a moment ago. Uh, the Making Center, which uh, as, a, as a facility occupies three, three floors over at the Sheila Johnson Design Center, a uh, caddy corner over here with CNC uh, facilities, uh, 3D printing, uh, metal, wood, print shop, a uh, 16 camera motion capture studio with a green screen, um, uh, a ceramic studio. The idea was to hybridize a whole series of practices all in one dynamic space in order that you could bring them together in the same way that the curriculum brings together the disciplines of practice. Um, and so it's making and thinking and practice and discipline all together. That facility is then connected to some uh, more specific uh, making facilities on 25 East 13th Street, where we have a furniture shop and a metal shop and a range of other uh, facilities across the campus. Um, and so uh, you will get a chance to see these. I think this will animate, or it won't. Ah, there it goes. That's actually the motion capture studio down there. But you'll get a chance to see some of these facilities um, uh, if you haven't already. Finally, um, the uh, making center, uh, sorry, the faculty. And I, all, all I want to say now uh, about the faculty beyond the fact that it is, as dean of the college, um, one of the great privileges uh, to have served uh, as dean and head of the faculty for the last decade, um, but that this group of individuals that I too chose to join 15 years ago um, for precisely the reasons of enriching the research capable on the part of faculty, I'm an architect uh, and was, have always been working in the areas of sustainability and climate change, and my decision to come here was very much about deepening that research in the university context and maintaining practice in the field where I was putting those things uh, into 
uh, the real world. And that's a lot of what our faculty do is that hybridization between research and creative practice and making and teaching. But it's an extraordinary group of individuals, um, 170 of them here full time, another uh, 1,200 of them coming from the various different practices uh, across New York City, the leading artists and designers, designers and innovators in business and foresight are all teaching with us here precisely because of the mixture and the vibrancy of the place itself. And that is driven by the student population. And so it's an amazing place to be. Uh, in a few moments, you will get a chance to hear from a few of those faculty. But right now, I want to give this back to Aaron to talk you through a few more pieces uh, of the um, admissions process, if you will. Thank Great. you. Thanks, Joel. So I'm actually going to jump across the ocean for just a moment to share a little more about Parsons Paris. Um, Parsons Paris is actually the first European campus abroad of a, a US institution in Europe back in 1921. Um, this building itself was refurbished in completely about five years ago, so it's a little bit newer than that. Um, but we actually had three programs that a student could study there in entirety. Our business program, strategic design and management, fashion design, and a um, a digital program that combines communication design, creative coding, and fine arts called art media and technology. For many of our students, though, they might just want to take advantage of a semester or a year abroad. Our campus is located in the first arrondissement. And as you can tell, I do not speak French from the way I just said that. But thankfully, um, this is just us abroad. Everything is taught in English there. Um, and it's an amazing opportunity. Students sometimes ask me, well, what's, what's the difference besides the cities themselves? Um, one, this campus is just under 300 students, so it is a really quite a different and intimate environment. Um, and also, while the classes and titles would be the same, um, the inflections and influences, of course, being in Europe um, and being able to access, um, obviously, a different set of museums, artists, and designers there will feel a little bit different. So it's definitely something to look into and think about. Also, Parsons Paris is not our only opportunity to study abroad. We have exchanged partnerships all over the world, um, many of which will depend on the major that you ultimately decide for the best match to our curriculum. Um, but this is just one of, of many global opportunities you could take advantage of. I also want to share a little bit more about the rest of the university, um, starting with a way, um, in addition to a minor, as Joel mentioned, that you might take advantage of the university beyond just Parsons itself. Um, and that begins with um, the BA BFA pathway. So this is a five-year program um, in which you, it's not a double major, it's, a, it's two degrees at once. And as you can imagine, our students um, take quite a few classes to accomplish that in five years. You do select this program itself on the common application, which I'll get to in a few moments. But for many of our students, they might arrive in a certain program and that you can apply internally um, to possibly add it later on. Um, and this is a great way to link um, two different areas of study in a really intense way. Um, another um, project I want to take a look at is, um, and, and Joel alluded to some of this, is there's many different courses and projects across the university um, that encapsulate lots of different programs. So this is one of my favorite, actually, of us, um, one of our students at Manus, which is our classical conservatory, working with students from fashion design and design and technology to change the way that you might approach um, the garments that you wear for stage. So there's a series of sensors in this garment that's controlling the lighting that you're seeing. So talking specifically about those other schools, Eugene Lang College is our, where our students study the liberal arts in a, a seminar style approach. Um, an average class size at Lang is 12 students. This is way too big. We actually, um, here at the new school, over 92% of our classes are less than 20 students. Um, so that idea of that really large lecture hall happens very, very rarely in any part of our curriculum. But a student studying at Lang would be um, studying a major in the liberal arts. So everything from politics to anthropology uh, to socio sociology, psychology, and so on. Um, so many of our students, as Joel mentioned, you don't have to minor within your school. Um, actually, psychology is our, most, our second most popular minor. So maybe you want to um, take advantage of having these different programs to ultimately enhance your specific study within art and design. 
And going on to the College of Performing Arts. Um, so the College of Performing Arts um, is going to be an approach to performance both in drama and in, and in music in three different schools, studying across majors like these, everything from orchestral instruments to our major in dramatic arts. The audition process is going to be really important for any of our programs, um, but we do have some minors that also touch upon music and performance in different ways, so other things to keep in mind. But starting with Manus, this is our classical conservatory. Um, and actually, one of my favorite performances, I'm so excited that I'm hitting my mic, um, th that we do throughout the year is one where they score um, and have a live orchestra performance to a, a silent film. Um, and there's actually hundreds of different uh, music performances and dramatic performances on campus all throughout the year. So something to take advantage of as a, as a new school community as a whole. And then we have the School of Drama, where we offer a BFA in Dramatic Arts. And this is going to be for a student that's really interested in combining um, writing, acting, directing, and um, creative technologies, which would be stagecraft. Um, so if for a student that's interested in specifically using the stage for education, the stage to be a global citizen, um, and wants a really well-rounded dramatic um, performance program, that would be a great fit. And then we have the School for Jazz and Contemporary Music. Um, so students are going to specifically study within this genre. Um, again, performances constantly. And I will say when we talk about our housing or we talk about our general university spaces, these students are also going to be your classmates and colleagues here at the institution. So while I imagine many of you in this room will focus in art and design or business, knowing that there are these other opportunities. And actually, if you're really excited about any of these programs, um, the open house for them is right after this one. So at 1 o'clock, their main session kicks off, and there is enough time to get over to the building where that's held. If you think, wow, I really want to know more about those, or what's that BA, BFA degree? I want to know about that other half of study. So um, definitely talk to one of us if you want guidance to head to one of those sections next, um, because there are certainly many, many ways to study across the institution itself. So let's talk about how we get here. Um, I know from talking to a few of you today, we have many of you that are from down the street or within the city itself and those who have traveled quite far. Um, and let's begin about where maybe you might stay when you're here. So we do actually have five dormitories, and three of them are open today if you'd like to tour one. Um, this gives you a little bit of a sense of how those dorms are laid out. Um, so that one is where we are right now. Carey Hall is actually um, on top of us. So if we kind of head straight up, um, I will let you know that first year students are not placed there. Um, it's something aspirational, but it is quite close by if you want to take a peek. Um, and then also numbers two and three, Loeb and Stuyvesant, which are both first year dorms, those are open today. I would typically recommend that maybe that's the last thing that you do since you will be sort of walking off campus to get there. Um, most of our dormitories are also going to be suite style. So you might have a roommate and, um, and then perhaps an, another set of roommates that are sharing a common um, kitchen and living space and bathroom. Um, so they, very much most of them are set up as small apartments with the exception of 13th Street, um, which is not available today. We do also have uh, multiple cafeterias on campus, including two um, different coffee shops that are located within our buildings. Your ID card also works at many different places to dine in the area as well. Um, it's tempting, I know, but you could try to live off pizza for the first couple of weeks, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but definitely taking advantage of the area itself while you're here. We also have dozens of different clubs and activities um, here on campus. That's Narls. He's a narwhal. Um, he's our mascot. Um, and we do offer everything from our school newspaper to intramural sports. Um, I also think that one thing our students really want to take advantage of in addition to our clubs and activities are utilizing the city itself. Um, I was asking a student the other day, I said, I don't, I don't know if we have a, a comedy club. And he said, well, we, we don't, but I go to the Upright Citizens Brigade for classes, which is what people move to New York to go to for improv. Um, so being able to fold in the city itself in the pursuit um, of, of your activities and interests is really important. 
Um, and also on this stage itself and many smaller venues um, throughout um, the campus. We have an amazing public program series. So numerous artists, designers, lecturers coming often on this stage um, for debate and discussion, and, and quite a few that really kind of end up with lines around the block, but mostly free to all of our current students and staff here at the institution. Internships are also a really important part of your study here. Um, and most of our students will do two or three during their time with us. Um, this is just a snapshot of some of the places our students work, over 1,200 different companies in New York City alone last year, everything from Google to the Museum of Modern Art. We want students to really think of their internships as an extension of the work that we're doing in the classroom. So oftentimes waiting till um, at least after um, you've, you've gotten a couple semesters under your belt is recommended, but it's very much a part of all of our students' education here is the ability to connect outside um, with the city and with companies and outside programs. Um, we have a long list of, of historic alumni, everyone from Mark Jacobs to Ryan McGinley, but for me, some of the alumni that I often think about are the most recent students that are graduating from product design and thinking about how to create a product that will help um, the, um, prevent the way that disease is spread in their home country of India. Um, to Taylor Haney, who's the CEO of the company Outdoor Voices, um, only having graduated a few years ago. So um, that ability here, as Joel pointed out, I think our curriculum really lends for that really natural launching point out into industry and into the world. So I'm going to get into a few of the details, starting with um, scholarships and student financial services. Um, and one thing I want to point out when I'm talking about merit-based scholarships, I'm going to go over the application process in just a moment. And the way that we consider all of our applicants for merit-based scholarships is through the application process itself. So when you're thinking about this of, oh, but how do I get a scholarship? I'm going to tell you what our best fit student might look like in just a moment. But there's nothing else you have to ask for or check off um, when it comes to the merit-based aid. For student financial services, and as far as need-based aid, um, for students that are US citizens or permanent resident, you would fill out the free application for federal aid, the FAFSA, um, for need-based consideration. Our tuition, depending on slightly on program, as I mentioned, we do have that five-year program, um, is just between upper 46,000 to 48,000 per year. I do also point out that the tuition for Parsons Paris is a little different. There's a conscious effort, as since its location in Europe, um, wanting to respond a little more specifically to um, that particular university environment and cost. There's also an average up there um, for university housing, which is close to 20,000 as an average um, for a double occupancy room. We do not require our students to live in our housing. Um, typically about 90% of our first year students do. And one really recent change that we made is that we guarantee housing to freshmen and transfer students that apply by May 1. Um, so that would be for the fall 19 deadline. As I mentioned, you don't have to choose to live in our housing, but many of our students do specifically for that launch point into New York itself. So the application process. Um, the common application is open for both spring and fall 2019, so it is available now. And we have two application plans for those applying to Parsons. And that's going to be early action and regular decision. Early action is coming up quite quickly. That's November 1st. That means all of your materials are due by November 1. Um, or regular decision, which is how most of our students still apply, and that's January 15th. Um, so you're making a choice about which one of those you want to pursue. Early action is non-binding, so that means that if you are admitted, you have time to think about it. You're not um, early decision, you must attend. Early action gives you choice, and you still do have until the May 1st deposit deadline. So keeping in mind either November 1st or January 15th, we do also bring in a small spring class, and that deadline is even sooner, and that's October 15th. So if anybody here is a transfer student um, or maybe has taken a gap semester, that could be also an option um, that you're looking to pursue. Uh, if you're applying as a transfer student for fall 19, that deadline is April 1st. We generally don't review applications very much sooner than that, so take the time to work on your application until then. Um, we often need the semester grades that a student's currently in to be able to start reviewing those applications. 
All right, so what are we looking for? What do we need? As I mentioned, we are on the Common Application, which is used by over 700 different universities in the United States. And you would search for the new school and then select your individual school. So that's going to be Parsons, or if you're applying to Lang or Performing Arts, you would, or Parsons Paris, you would choose those separately underneath. We have one common essay, which is why the new school? Why your program of study? Um, and if I had some, some helpful hints when it comes to this, uh, the more specific a student can usually be, the better. So is there a project you saw online? Is there a faculty member that you read about? Is there something really, um, really strong that's standing out to you as for why you should be there? Um, sometimes I see students um, turn this essay into an ode to New York City. And that's wonderful and beautiful, but we live here in New York, so we know a little bit about it. What I really want to know is more about you and why you would be a great fit in this university environment and in the programs that we offer. So that is within the common application itself. Transcripts typically get sent to us directly from your high school, or if um, they do need to come from you, they must, must, must be in a sealed envelope. Um, we look for two letters of recommendation, one teacher, one counselor. I got this question a lot last week. Your teacher recommendation doesn't have to be an art teacher. Your teacher recommendation should be from whomever can best speak about who you are and what you're doing. And one thing with letters of recommendation that I always hope happens is that it might tell me something that the rest of your application does not, giving specific details maybe about how you work or, or other specific projects you might be working on. I'm going to talk more about the portfolio and Parsons Challenge in just a moment. And I'll mention that the audition is required for the College of Performing Arts, and that's going to vary quite a bit um, from even each instrument and program. We are also test optional, so we do not require an SAT or ACT. Um, and this is also not a trick thing. If, if it's something that you don't feel is going to enhance your application, you do not have to send it. If it's something you're really excited about, you can. Um, so, but it is not something that we're going to look for if you don't have it. I will also, though, just point out that if English is not your native language, we may require a TOEFL, IELTS, or PTE score. Um, there are a couple different exceptions for this. For example, if English isn't your native language, but all of your high school education has been in English, um, we do waive the score for situations such as those. And you can ask myself or one of my team members if you have specific questions about that afterwards. So a little refresher on our programs, because when you're selecting these majors on the Common App, um, these are what you would choose. We do also offer an option for a student to come in undeclared. So if you're really not sure and you're thinking, ah, that, that first year program sounds great. I'll use that to kind of figure out what I want to do. Fantastic. Apply undeclared. If you're really excited about a program, I would apply to it and put that down and, and you can use your application to support why you might want to pursue that particular area of study. Um, the one thing I'm also just going to point out is that in our first year, it's really created to hopefully um, open you up to new types of experiences make and making that you haven't had already. And we do have quite a few students every year who do this first year and since you all have to do it together, um, say, oh, wow, I didn't know about this. I'd like to internally apply to change to that. Um, it happens every year. We don't guarantee that we can accommodate every single person that asks to change to every single major, but we really do try. And I will tell you now, that deadline in March is so important because oftentimes where we run into trouble is when students blow past that deadline and want to change quite quite a lot later in that cycle. So just something to keep in mind as you're thinking about how you might start your education specifically at Parsons. All right, so that portfolio. I know from the emails, phone calls we get, this is often the thing that people have the most questions about. And I see like a rustling of notes and things happening now too, so that's great. Um, so our portfolio is not major specific. It's uploaded through a program called SlideRoom. That's eight to 12 images of work. And I'm going to share a little more with you. But I will say that something that students often get confused about, I think, is that we ask for 8 to 12 images of work and any type of media that you'd like to share, but there's not any other specifics. And if you're looking at other art and design schools, they might say three pieces of observational work, two figure drawings. And I think people get to us and they say, well, where's that missing? Why haven't I seen it? It's because we leave it open and up to you. And really, for me, the best case scenario is a portfolio that's going to tell me about you, what you're excited about, what you're interested in, what's really um, making you think. 
So that different, those ratios and what you'd like to share, those are some of your choices in the curation of your portfolios is all a part of this. So let's look at some work. Um, and so these are all pieces of work that have come from different students that have applied and been admitted to Parsons. Um, and we, when we go through this, we try and choose a variety just to show that work can look a lot of different ways. We do suggest that there's a little bit of media exploration. And what I mean by that is if you give me 12 pen and ink drawings, there's a lot of pressure for an application committee to say, can they do other things? Do we, are, they, are they ready to make in other areas? Whereas usually if you have a little bit of variety, then we get a greater understanding of what it is um, that you can make in a couple different types of media. You are welcome to include process. And if you don't know what process is, process are the pieces that come before the final thing. So whether it's um, keeping a book of ideas and notes or your sketchbook, or even some sort of primary um, doodles that eventually get to something else, you can lay out and format different pages to share that kind of work. A portfolio does not all need to be completely pristine um, and complete. It can also be some of these other pieces that are along the way. Work should be personal. It should be about you. Um, so if your portfolio is only pieces of work that someone else told you to do, I don't get to learn very much about you and what you're excited about. And of course, you're probably in art and design classes and you're going to have some assignments, but hopefully that your portfolio will reflect a little bit about what you're interested in. Think about how you might capture the work that you're making. Maybe you have a 3D object that would be better explored through a video, or um, maybe you're taking um, multiple um, angles of something so that you can really show off um, what, what it is that you're making. One thing I've realized recently is that um, I, think, I think students sometimes, they forget that really just because, you know, you've got a computer screen, right? And you're uploading all this work to a computer monitor. I see what's on the monitor. And what that means that is if that you've made a little tiny something in the corner that's really important, our team might not actually be able to see all of that. So really thinking critically for yourself about what's on that page. You're really curating the slideshow about yourself. Think about what could go on a page. So you can put multiple images on a page, and this is one example of how you might lay out a book, and here's another. Um, thinking about whether it's more important to give the overall impression of what you've done versus seeing the actual details in the slides. Those are your choices to make. And then thinking about um, just how does this look together? So these are a couple bodies of work that might be what a student has done in entirety. I will also say that one thing that comes into play too is you have the portfolio, but I also get to read so much about you. Um, and I get to see what maybe you've had access to, what experiences you've had. So for example, this is a student that's coming from a really intensive art and design um, high school. So taking multiple classes in making um, across the years um, that she was attending. So she's had a lot of involvement in art and design in a couple of different areas. And for another student, you might not have had access to as many art classes, and we're gonna take note of that and say, wow, this is what they were able to do with this one course, or maybe this after-school program, and this is the work that they might be taking and making. So we're, we're thinking about that too as we're getting to take a look um, at the body of work that you're presenting. Think about um, you know, a range between 3D and 2D, or if you explore digital, um, video, performance, really anything could fit within this space. Um, this is a student who's applied for photography, um, who uh, was really exploring her hometown of Los Angeles and um, pursuing it both from um, a sort of a very editorial and very um, uh, photojournalistic sense, but also um, really taking a, another landscape and color-based um, approach. Student doing a little bit of everything from um, more graphic and logo design to experimenting with um, abstract pieces and different um, digital layouts, as well as one exploration of a trip that um, he had taken to Japan. So both through a still image zine as well um, as a, a, a short set of video clips that he put together. So this really can be different. This hopefully gives you a little bit of a sense of the types of things that could be in a portfolio and what you might submit. 
there's also something called the Parsons Challenge. Um, and the Parsons Challenge uh, is required for all applicants. I do want to point out that the um, students that apply to the BBA in Strategic Design and Management do not need to do a portfolio. They do need to do this, though. And it's, there's a slight variation on that in response to that. The Parsons Challenge asks you to take a piece of work that you might have already. In the student's case, it was a still life they'd done of this fish. And then ultimately scanned it in and made this pattern and made this print on a, a scarf. Because what we ask you to do is make a new piece of work um, that is hopefully going to um, share with us a little bit more about your making process. You have to rethink something. And students often ask, is this the right thing? Did I do the, is this the right project? And I say, it's, it's not about choosing the right thing. It's actually about the 500 word essay that goes along with this process, where we get to see how you are making and creating through your words. So thinking about attaching your visuals um, to the work that you're making. And this is a student that applied to the BBA program. Um, and those students can also choose an invention or advertisement as their inspiration. Um, so this was their book of process, looking at these really strange beauty inventions from the 50s, um, putting this book together, and then ultimately making this satirical confidence cream poster um, to reflect on that. So, if you haven't had one before, one thing I would also highly recommend um, is visiting us at one of the National Portfolio Days. Um, there's actually one today in Minneapolis and Columbus, Ohio. Um, next week is Milwaukee and Chicago. Um, these events are hosted all throughout North America from late September through mid-January. And what they are is you can take your portfolio and say, hey, could you into multiple schools, not just us. You could take our, your portfolio and see numerous schools at the same time and say, could you reflect on my work a little bit and let me know if you have any advice or feedback specific to um, the application process. So this is something um, that you might also want to think about throughout your journey. It's really helpful um, to often get curated feedback because each school is a little different in what we're thinking about and what you might apply to. So with that, I would actually love to invite a few more people up to stage um, to share a little bit more about um, what we do here as an institution and in the classroom space. Um, so Joel's going to come back out. Actually, we get to explore um, a panel with um, several different faculty from across the institution. I'll turn back. Yeah. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah. We're going to um, conclude this session with uh, a conversation with some of my colleagues in the faculty. Uh, in a moment, I'll have them uh, introduce themselves. Uh, what I'll say is that all three of them hold leadership positions uh, across Parsons in a variety of different ways. Um, uh, John Key is the director of the Bachelor of Business Administration program, uh, Shana as the director of the first year program, and Yvonne. Uh, as the Associate Dean for Curriculum and Learning across all of Parsons, but that's not why they're here today. <laughs> they're here as faculty. Um, we all are here as faculty to have a, a short conversation and maybe even if there are questions that can be shouted out, we'll take them that way too. But just to talk a little bit about the experience of being a faculty member at Parsons, um, uh, uh, Shana worked with us from the very beginning on that curricular innovation work that I described to you. Yvonne um, helped translate that throughout the entire fashion curriculum. Uh, John Key has been teaching in this program since we launched the new curriculum in the business degree areas. And so I wanted to start um, and uh, ask you to think about ways in which you have interacted with that curriculum in ways that feel different than um, it might be in other art and design contexts, or what ways in which that curriculum has really afforded you an opportunity to work in a cross-disciplinary way that might, might feel um, unique. And if you want to say a couple words um, about who you are in the process of introducing, that would be great. So I'll start with you, Junkie. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, everyone. Sunday morning in New York City. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, I have been very fortunate to come to the Parsons, and especially in this new push around the questions of how can we apply the notions of design into everyday problem solving, especially in the context of organizations and businesses. And we've been seeing this trend already in the business world tremendously. 
And then we have seen in the companies like Apple, which is now valued at $1 trillion to, a, to the massive speculation from the Wall Street, <laughs> that exists because that company has been providing and focusing on the processes that is different from other Silicon Valley companies. And that's 20 years ago. And then what we're seeing today is that how in the business world that I was involved, whether it was my startups to uh, working on economic development policies in New York City, I've seen that applied in the first hand. And I had a fortunate opportunity to come to Parsons because here in the business context in our curriculum, they're talking about we want to create a new course called information visualization. Data visualization has been a field that has been exists in the infographic world, uh, that has been now advanced because of the adoption of data science, that has been applicable for all different types of fields, whether it's fashion, design, manufacturing, supply chain management. But how to process that information and communicate that has been the forefront of business analytics and communications. I never met someone who is willing to teach that course into the levels and undergraduate. I never met someone who is willing to push that ideas into the core experience of a Parsons education. So not only once I was first contacted by Parsons leadership team to come in and integrate this into their core curriculum and then really push and see what happened, I had a fortunate opportunity to come and do so. And then from that point on, I think over and over the experience that I had is Parsons education really thrived because they bring in the best people who are working in the field in New York City and around the world today who are testing out these new fields of idea and incorporate that into the education in a setting, working with external partners, working with the real life cases. And I think that's real the value is, and I've been very fortunate to be a part of it. So I could imagine that communication might be a theme that would emerge across this panel, but Shana, what, what are your thoughts? Um, so thank you for having me here today, and thanks all of you for being here today. Um, as Joel said, my name's Shana Agate, and I uh, teach, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to answer this question this way. <laughs> I teach in my own practice crosses things that don't make sense together to most people. So I spend a lot of time trying to make sense of how my work as a book artist, as a letterpress printer, as a designer who works with social justice movements, and as a writer, all goes together in some way. Um, it would make perfect sense if the design that I did with social justice movements was um, communication design or visual design. I'm a horrible communication designer, while I would argue I'm a decent book artist. Um, I do make posters when asked, but really the kinds of design work that I do is working with social justice, or social justice organizations to think about how it is that we do the work that we do, right? So how do we shape the capacity to speak to people, the capacity to learn from social justice movements of the past, the capacity to build and imagine new ways of uh, working and functioning uh, in the present and the future. So for me, one of the most incredible things about teaching here and working with my colleagues here, and in particular working with students here, is the ability to think across those things in a place where that doesn't actually seem so strange, right? So it makes actually perfect sense to the vast majority of people with whom I work on a daily basis, both students and faculty and staff, to actually be thinking about what are the kinds of things we can learn from the narrative thinking that goes into making a long-term book project that's about my most recent work is about thinking about um, baseball in relationship to uh, uh, caring for a parent while dying, right? So thinking about how do we take the imagination and the sort of creative work that goes into trying to tell a story like that and think simultaneously about how that, that what you learn from being able to do that kind of narrative work actually also begins to help us shape how to have conversations with social justice organizations about the narrative of the work in the future that they are already working to build, right? So I'm really interested in how it is that um, through our curriculum, we're able to focus on students sort of beginning to experiment with and learn about things like, how do I know when I really want to do something on my own? And how do I know how to learn what I need to learn to make that happen, right? Or how do I know that there's a project I really want to do? And not only can I not probably do all of it by myself, but in fact, I would really like to do this with other people 
because I think I have something to learn from other folks in doing this, and because this is something that having lots of people involved is gonna mean actually it has a different kind of life. And so one of the things that we really focus on in the first year, but I would argue as sort of a springboard for what happens um, throughout a four-year or a five-year education here, is thinking about what it means to be able to actually think about the thing you are trying to make happen Think about what it is and who it is that you need to draw to you, whether those are books you need to read, films you need to see, music you need to be listening to, or other people that you need to surround yourself with. And then being able to grow and adjust through the kinds of learning that happens to be able to make that kind of project come out the way that you hope it will, even if it ends up in a very different form. Um, so in my mind, one of the strongest things about the way that we um, the way that the curriculum sort of organizes that set of possibilities is that it's always thinking about and working with the idea of what are the sort of, um, what are the theories, right? Small t theories. What are the, the ways of thinking that we're developing over time together? And how do those constantly, think, how do we think about those as constantly intersecting with the practices that we're doing to try to make those things real? And it's that work across that kind of small t theory by which I basically mean thinking and having ideas along with the kind of strategic work of having a practice that makes those things like a thing you can actually bring into the world. So the, the, collaborate, the collaborative piece of it, right? So the, the data, the visualization, the collaboration, the cross-disciplinarity, all of these things come together. Yvonne has been from day one here um, helping us to bring fashion design into the 21st century, uh, something desperately needed and I think that has happened so successfully in this program, in part because I think introducing ideas about collaboration and communication has been at the, at the heart of that as well as the kind of information that informs fashion. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was um, listening just as um, both John Key and uh, Shana were speaking. Um, I think there was a particular Point. Uh, so I've been here at Parsons for um, eight years. And um, when I arrived, um, I think fashion was in a very kind of like typical um, space in terms of, you know, the maybe the more individual notion of like what it is to be a fashion designer. And, you know, we were really kind of also confronting a lot of the issues around, um, you know, the transformation of the industry. Um, the fact that a lot of... Um, production and manufacturing is no longer local, but is now um, overseas. And what does that mean if you are um, a fashion design student and you are a fashion design, a fashion designer or a fashion design company? And what would we need to do as educators to be able to support students who are going into a rapidly uh, transforming industry? And so I think a lot of the things uh, that both Junkie and Shana spoke to was what we started to kind of like really think uh, about and integrate into fashion. So, you know, how could we have um, critical thinking be uh, a kind of a foundation element? You know, how could we create um, students who would be thinking as uh, really great designers? So we would make sure they would have all of the kind of uh, necessary skills hand skills, but we also wanted to kind of like combine that with uh, a whole other range of skills as well. The skill of um, what it is to bring collaborative practice. Um, what, what is possible when you start to think about fashion as a, a tool of communication and, you know, to have um, a practice that could also speak to um, social justice, environmental social justice, to uh, sustainable practices. And I think what we've seen is a complete transition where we have, you know, some really extraordinary students where it's now... Um, the status is such that it's just kind of like common practice in the main for students to think about fashion design through the lens of many of these kind of aspects, um, which for me is a thrill um, because it just has, you know, the, the potential for the disruptors, the entrepreneurs, uh, the innovators. Um, to really now be able to kind of explore a lot of different spaces. You know, um, fashion doesn't have to be like this singular um, static experience. What we have now is that it is expanded um, as an experience and um, there are openings for many, many different types of fashion designers. 
St staying with you for a second, Yvonne, mm -hmm. um, I, I want to talk about project-based learning yes. with all of you and to use an example. And I'm, I'm thinking about your former student, Angela Luna, who we both saw the other day. Um, as, a, as a kind of example of someone who had to learn a great deal about something outside of the area of fashion yeah. in order to do the project that she had undertaken in her thesis. And I think it's maybe a good example to describe. Um, yes, certainly. Um, so Angela, um, um, on graduating, uh, created a brand called a diff. But essentially, a diff um, was her senior thesis experience. And um, you know, she had uh, she was in a section where we had a focus on kind of um, it was actually it was more of a kind of like evening wear a kind of section, and we kind of like flipped that a little bit. But in order for her to be able to develop what she had. Um, as a kind of concept, it really required her to do a wide range of research. And so the concept that she came up with was um, a product that would be suitable for refugees as they were transitioning from different areas um, that would be multifunctional. And so if you think about this as, you know, kind of what project-based learning could be, I mean, it meant that she had to be uh, very hands-on. She had to really get the data. Um, you know, she spoke with, uh, you know, different stakeholders in, you know, both in refugee camps, but also, you know, people who work um, alongside and with um, refugees. Um, and I think what was just really interesting was the kind of like depth of her research that when paired with you know her kind of like technical expertise to then create a series of functional garments so one garment that is a coat and then becomes a tent a flotation system you know i think these are all things that um, are you know incredibly um relevant i have depth and really kind of speak to like what the possibility is of you know really bring in at the moment, for the moment, kind of project-based learning. So Shana and, and John Key, thinking about learning through doing, um, maybe just one kind of example that comes to mind. Yeah, I think one of the key aspects of within our BBA curriculum is towards the end of their senior year, you have an opportunity to work with external partners. So these are the curated group of companies with specific issues and problems they have. And then they work with our student teams to come up with a creative intervention. That could be a new type of service, that could be a new type of research, or that could be a new type of spatial experience, anything that comes out from it. And a lot of times we work with um, the key aspects of our degree is also we're industry agnostic. So we work with companies like Johnson & Johnson's to Nickelodeon's to Sesame Street to um, one of the cases that I want to share is a project that our students did. Megan Jaina, she did a project with Makeup Forever. In her case, she was actually interning at this company at the time. And then what she realized in the retail experiences in the store, there is no uh, strong recycling and sustainability initiative. So for her senior project, what she ended up developing is that I'm really passionate about sustainability and recycling program that can actually provide uh, revenues for the company at the same time deliver additional value to the customers and the users who are walking into the space. By creating an incentive program, creating a digital interfaces that customers can interact with, she ended up pitching that idea to her supervisor in our second phase of a, of a senior project, she actually get to launch the pilot project and install that uh, new systems and new program in the store itself. <laughs> when she graduated, of course, make a forever coming. You seems like you know what you're doing. Let's give you a job. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just a one example yep. of working with people who are in the city, in the top of the industries, and we're able to apply the concepts and things that we learn in classrooms and apply it and see it actually grow. Because that aspects we cannot teach. Learning through doing to employment. I like the last part of that. Yeah. Shana? Um, I wish we could guarantee that. That would be perfect. <laughs> um, so a, a, 
I'm going to talk quickly about a course that I teach um, with mostly uh, sophomores and juniors in the School of Design Strategies. That's called CoLab Human Services. And I've been teaching this class now. I've had the benefit of teaching this class for about 10 years. And in that time, we've had two partners. And during the sort of middle period, uh, we overlapped. And we were lucky enough to get some or maybe, maybe we wrote a good enough grant, but we got some funding to do a two-year project, which can be hard to do in a semester-based system. And one of the hardest things about doing project-based learning of any kind in, um, in any kind of educational institution is the timeline, right? So the timeline of a project could be all kinds of things, right? So you're both describing things that clearly took longer than one semester um, and have also now sort of grown into other kinds of jobs and other kinds of work. Um, and so one of the key things that I was interested in doing with my colleagues was figuring out how could we give people an opportunity to work on the same thing for two years um, in a credited way that allowed for a different sort of timeline for learning and engaging with that. Um, and so we, we made this project, it's called The Ship's First Shape Was a Raft, which is after a poem by the poet Kay Ryan um, that is about the trouble of making something as you go, right? That sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, and we were able to engage um, with students from a, a local nonprofit that works with uh, people in an in a alternative incarceration program called the Fortune Society, with a local high school called the Washington Heights Expeditionary Learning School, which is just uptown here in Manhattan, which is a regular district public school. Um, and with the project that a colleague of mine and I here were working on called Working With People, that was, um, is a project that's sort of oriented to trying to figure out how you ground project-based work in hard conversations about the language that we use. So we took all of this and tried to figure out if we have two years, what could we do together through the lens of service design, which is the focus of this collab class. And so what came to pass was that a, we had sort of the capacity to have a group of maybe five or six new school-based students, they were mostly Parsons students, who could continue for the full two years in a supported way. And then we had the capacity to, to similarly um, have sort of stipended opportunities for students at the Fortune Society and students at Wheels. And over the course of those two years, what we were able to, be, to do um, was to create a kind of uh, collective platform for learning, not only for designing a service from nothing, right? So uh, starting from doing sort of basic assessment of what it is that people wanted and needed in each of those sites, and then figuring out together what it might look to create uh, something that resonated in both sites to the students in both of those sites saying, well, we don't want something that resonates. We want something that actually everybody can access. So, and they were about 30 blocks apart. So we started trying to figure out like, how do we actually bring everybody together in one space? If we can't do that, how do we create a common mission that manifests in different ways in each space? And what I saw over the course of that chunk of two years was that people actually had the capacity to build relationships, students mostly, but also us as teachers, to build relationships that meant that we could ask very difficult questions of ourselves and each other, that meant that we built capacity for arguing and disagreeing, but also for coming up with new ideas that none of us would have actually had on our own, and ultimately were able to start these sort of student-led cafes in each space with this common mission. Beyond that, those students now have been able to do things like um, start in their own spaces in the high school a um, critical theory and social justice club that was supported through some of the work that they were doing in that space. And then the students here at Parsons were able to begin thinking about how to take that kind of learning that they'd done about building capacity with other people, oftentimes differently situated from themselves, and lead that into their thesis work. So these were students who started working in my class, mostly as sophomores, and ended up sort of working on those same kinds of questions that they pulled from the class, not necessarily with me or with our class, all the way through their senior years. And so the one thing I'll say is that related to the first year experience, there's a course in the second semester called Integrative Studio and Seminar 2. And in that course, we asked students to begin thinking about identifying a research question around mid-semester after learning some skills for doing research. Anyway, and you work with the same question in studio and in seminar. And this is unusual. I don't know of another version of this class elsewhere. I, I, you know, that I have not seen any colleagues who teach similar classes. And what happens in this class is that students do this work, right? You identify your own question. You figure out how you can go about addressing that question, whether it's about answering it or asking better questions, which becomes part of the work. Um, 
And you do that in studio class and you also do it in seminar class in ways that could be really, really tightly integrated or, and I think some of the most incredible project-based learning happens in this way, where people, students begin to recognize the ways in which some questions can be asked through a making process that's very different than the type of question that you ask through a um, research process that's based in um, reading around precedents and reading about other sort of theoretical and historical um, ideas. And the kinds of work that come out of those, I've seen intervene on um, sort of really critical ideas around sustainability, even in our own classrooms. Um, a really great project came out um, uh, around a proposal back to us in the first year, actually, about more meaningfully integrating sustainable systems and space materiality as a course, which we're now working with students to follow up on. Um, and I've also seen really, really compelling arguments for ways to use the space of the school to begin thinking about um, grounding social justice issues in particular in the physical space so that students feel that they have a place to go and have these conversations where those ideas are reflected. So I see that happening at the senior level, like um, these folks are describing, but I've also seen it happening in some really compelling ways in the second semester of people's first years where they're literally transforming the curriculum and the landscape of the school. So thank you all. I know Aaron is letting me know that we need to let this group move on to the next part of your exploration. But I, I just want to thank you not just for coming in on Sunday and making this presentation, but Shana's last description reminds me that um, there isn't a day that I don't go home from this school feeling more hopeful than when I started the day. And the idea that you could have thoughtful, critical, difficult conversations in a meaningful way that could lead to a collaborative solution uh, is something so desperately needed in this world today. Uh, and that's actually what we're teaching students to do. We're teaching them to be engaged citizens, to be thoughtful citizens, to be open-minded, and to be solution-oriented, um, rather than fighting with each other constantly and not actually getting anywhere. So, to me, that's actually what I was taking as I was listening to all of you speak, so I appreciate that greatly. And now, where are you, Aaron? There you are. What do we do now? Do we hand it to you? Yes, I got it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Um, thank you for sharing.